Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with... We're going to do a Bible study. We're in the book of Genesis. This is Genesis chapter 22, the title of the lesson, A Substitute. It's the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac as God required. Well, it's an interesting story. This is session one in our spring quarter. So let's get started. Uh, it's actually cover, going to cover 21 through 23, but we only have time to focus on chapter 22, which is where Abraham offers Isaac. But back in chapter 21, Isaac is actually born. And uh, so years go by before ch chapter 22. Ishmael and Hagar are now gone. Uh, they've been sent away because uh, God wants Abraham to focus just on Isaac. And a peace treaty is signed between Abraham and Abimelech, the king of Philistine. In chapter 23, we say goodbye to Sarah. She dies. Abraham buys a place to bury her. And so, and he will be buried in the same spot later when he dies. So Abraham is called our father of faith in Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Paul tells us that the Israelites think that they are Abraham's children because of the descendants, the physical descendants. But the real children of Abraham are the children who have faith. And in the case that Paul's talking about, it's the faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. But he says, Paul says, that there are, uh, there's a journey of faith that Abraham went on to for God to build him into a giant of faith. Now, MacArthur has a great sermon, and I've put that sermon in the folder where the PowerPoint uh, slides are, uh, if you want us to take a look at that. And he calls out five points of faith that God used to build Abraham up. One was the pil pilgrimage. Remember, he called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees and into the promised land. So that's the journey of faith. Then there's the promise that God made to Abraham, look at the stars in the sky and the dust of the ground. I'll make your descendants uh, more than those. And that's the patience of faith because Abraham had to wait 30 years for that to happen. And then there's the power, and that is the power that God exerted to bring uh, Sarah's womb back to life. And the fulfillment of that faith was the birth of Isaac. Then there's the presence, and that's throughout Abraham's journey. He feels the presence of God in many different ways. He learns God's name, and he's going to learn a new name for God today. And then there's the proof of, uh, God, of Abraham's faith. And that comes in today's lesson as well because Abraham is obedient to what God asks him to do. So let's get started. Chapter 22, verse one, Abraham's faith test. Sometime later, and this is when Isaac is now probably a teenager, although some people think he may have been in his 20s, perhaps even as old as 30. But based on how he addresses Isaac, I'm thinking perhaps he's a teenager at this point, old enough to carry wood on his back, but uh, still uh, old, uh, young enough to uh, be called a child. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham's response is instantaneous. Here I am, he replied. Abraham is used to talking with God, and his response is really up front. That's different than the God's last conversation there with uh, Adam in the Garden of Eden, where God says, where are you, Adam? And Adam replied, uh, I was hiding from you. <laughs> that, that's not good. So the preview of Christ. Now, we know this whole story of God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, is simply a type of God actually sacrificing Christ for our sins. So it, there's a lot of beautiful typology and, and symbolism and shadows uh, are all through this whole story. But we need to realize that Abraham wasn't aware of any of that yet. He, he was completely uh, trusting God to do what God and only God can do, but he wasn't aware of all the symbolic, symbolism that was going on here. That was, thousands of years later, we know the whole story and we can see that, for example. Uh, God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, that would be Isaac. And we know that it fast forward thousands of years and God says through uh, the apostle John, for God so loved the world that he gave, he sacrificed his only son. So we see that set up as the type there. And then where is the sacrifice going to happen? Well, look, it happens in Mount Moriah. 
Go to this region of Moriah's uh, mountain range, and I want you to sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And we know that that mountain is identified later in the scripture as the, uh, it was a threshing floor that later became the temple mount that is in Jerusalem. So that's where he told Isaac to take, or told Abraham to take Isaac to sacrifice him. Early the next morning, Abraham has now got mature faith. God told him to do this thing. And if he'd have asked me to do something like that, I would have said, I'm going to see if he changes his mind. I'm going to drag my feet. I'm going to wait until something else tells me that this is the right thing to do. But Abraham is a man of completely mature faith by this point in his life. And he says, I'm on it. And he says, early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And then they went to cut firewood on the way to Mount Moriah. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day of the journey, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. Compare that to Jesus. When Jesus told his disciples, I am going to Jerusalem to offer myself as a sacrifice. Look what he says and how he says it. I, Luke chapter 13, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, that's three days, for surely no prophet can die outside of Mount Moriah, Jerusalem, another type. But then he says something as they head up the mountain, uh, he says to his servants, I want you to stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go up there or over there. And then he says to them something of faith again. He says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Mm -hmm. Abraham knows he didn't wait 30 years for Isaac to take Isaac up and kill him and for that to be the end of the story. That was not a possibility. Mm -hmm. God was going to have to bring Isaac back to life the mm -hmm. same way that he brought Sarah's womb back to life. He knows this God named El Shaddai, the God that brings dead things back to life. So that's one thing he knows for sure about God because he has witnessed it firsthand and he just knows that that's going to happen again. So then in verse six, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. So that's how we know that Isaac is probably a teenager, maybe mid-teens. He's old enough to carry enough wood that the donkey was having to carry it before. So, so they're headed up this mountain with a load of wood on Isaac's back. And that's another part of the type. Look in John chapter 19, Jesus was going to Golgotha carrying the wood on his back, the wood of the offering on his back. So Isaac was doing the same thing that Jesus would do much later. So they go up the mountain and he himself, Abraham, carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. And then Isaac spoke up. Now, Isaac's got some questions coming up at this point in time. Hey, dad, he said to his father, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb that we'll use for the burnt offering? Now that we learn a lot of things here, one we learn is that this is not the first burnt offering uh, that God, that Abraham has offered to God. So, it's pretty clear that Isaac understands the term burnt offering. He is familiar with the process. He knows what's going on and he knows that there's fire. He knows that there's wood and he knows there's got to be an altar to make the sacrifice on, but there's something missing and that something is the lamb. Where's the lamb? And Abraham said, well, I know that God is El Shaddai, but... I also know that God will provide. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, thinking that Isaac, his son, was the lamb that God was going to provide. And the two of them went on together. But then remember in John chapter 1, verse 36, when the, uh, John the Baptist sees Jesus walking and he points for his disciples and he points to Jesus and he says, look, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm 
He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the lamb to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. So when they reached the place God had told Abraham about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the, he arranged the wood on it. He prepares for the sacrifice. He bound his son Isaac and he laid Isaac on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham, of course, replied, here I am. Same thing he said in verse one, he says in verse 11, here I am, he replied. And God says to Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to harm him. And then God praises Abraham's obedient faith. Now I know, God says, that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Mm -hmm. The thing most precious, the thing I promised, you have not withheld. Mm -hmm. So then Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. You remember John 19 verse two, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on the Lamb of God's head. So there's a substitute. He went over, took the ram, and he sacrificed the ram as a burnt offering instead of his son. God provided a substitute so that Isaac didn't have to die. So then Abraham in verse 14 called that place the Lord will provide. Now, this is just a beautiful verse. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, that's Jerusalem, it will be provided. It is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. This verse was written thousands of years before Jesus fulfilled it. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Wow. Well, we know from a few weeks ago that God told Abraham that his name was El Shaddai. And we see from Genesis 17, 28, 35, 48, and 49 that what that really means is he is the God who gives new life. He is the God of fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. He is the God that brings the dead womb of Sarah back to life so that they can be great descendants. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord, now we know that he knows him two ways. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. Look at this. And he said, I swear by myself, because there's no one higher to swear by, declares the Lord that because you have done this and you've not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands of the seashore. And those, that, it's a flashback to the two earlier promises of the covenant where the first time he promised, he said, look at the sand, look at the, the dirt, that your descendants will be more than the dust. And then the next time he says, look at the stars and if you could count them, which you can't, there will be more than the stars in the sky. Your descendants then will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, that would be Jesus, mm -hmm. all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a story that because we've studied it before, it may have lost its impact. Uh, but it just for a minute, stop and understand. I mean, we understand that it was a type of Christ. The whole story was God showing us way early what he was going to do with his son, his only son. Mm -hmm. But Abraham wasn't privy to that. All he knew was that God was the God who could bring Isaac back to life. And he told his people, he told his servants, we'll be back because he believed that God would raise him mm -hmm. from the dead. Let me summarize, and this summary is a little bit scattered, but, but see if you can follow it. Um, the pattern of faith, MacArthur says, there are only two ways to live life. One is to live by 
sight that based on everything that you can see in this world. And the other way to live is by faith. And that's everything that you can't see. And what Abraham teaches us with his pattern of faith is it looked like he was about to kill his son. It looked like Sarah's womb was dead. It looked like they needed to go to Sarah's handmaiden, uh, Hagar. It looked like uh, they weren't ever going to get the land in the promised land. It looked like, looked like, looked like, but Abraham didn't see any of that. He only saw by faith. He had faith to believe that no matter what it looked like, that God could make anything happen. He was the God Almighty. He was the El Shaddai. He was the Jehovah Jireh. He was the God who would provide. Well, I want to, as we review all of these lessons on Abraham, I want to kind of hone in on a part that I think is super important, and that is that that Abraham was, first of all, in his faith journey, the first part of his faith journey was he was called to come out, to be holy. The word holy means to be separate or to, to be called set apart. And so Noah, we know, uh, was called out of the world and God used an ark to do that. Abraham was called out of Ur and he used the promised land to be the destination. Moses was called out of Egypt uh, because he was had to be prepared and as a shepherd for 40 years. And then Joseph uh, was actually dead. He was in a pit. Uh, and that's a symbol that's used a lot. And he was called out of the pit to go into Egypt to prepare to save his family. And then Israel was later called out of Egypt and out of slavery, and they were called into the wilderness to prepare them for the promised land. But the, all of these stories are simply to, there to let us know that we Christians are called out of the world. Mm -hmm. We can't live the way Lot tried to live, mm -hmm. with one foot in Sodom and the other foot believing God. There's plenty of these stories here, and there are more about we are called out, out of the pit, out of death, to be alive in Christ. We're called to live by faith. So we're also called to wait as Christians. And this is not popular, but we had that lesson on patience. Noah had to wait for the flood to recede. Abraham had to wait 30 years for Isaac. Joseph had to wait a long time in Egypt for his family, a lot of that time in prison. And Israel, of course, had to wait 40 years before they got into the promised land. And Christians, we must wait for the return of our Christ Savior unless we go to be with him before he comes back. And like Abraham, God's promises we know are absolutely true and we can count on those. No matter what things look like, we know that God is is able and God's power is enough to bring the dead back to life. And God also has promised to provide everything that we need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And our faith is also proved through our changed lives. Everything that we do because of our faith is in obedience to God. Hebrews says it this way about Abraham in chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So his obedience was a result of his faith. You, you see that? Mm -hmm. It's obedience that comes because of what we believe about God. Mm -hmm. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, the son of whom it was said, through Isaac your offspring shall be named. And Abraham considered that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, God did raise him back to life because he provided a substitute. So how do we apply this wonderful story and this wonderful journey of faith that Abraham lived in our lives because we too are on a journey of faith? And, and Paul says our journey is, the pattern of our journey is Abraham's journey. So we know from watching his journey what ours is going to be like. The truth, according to A.W. A. Tozer, uh, who was a preacher back in the early 20th century, he said, the truth is that faith 
and obedience are really two sides to the same coin because you always find them together in Scripture. And that's not any different than what we just read about Abraham. Abraham was praised by God for his obedience, but Hebrews chapter 11 says it was his faith that drove the obedience. The obedience was simply the fruit from his faith. Oh, fruit, obedience, well, there you go. Obedience is the fruit of faith. Romans chapter one, verse five, through him, that would be Jesus, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to what? This is what we're all called to. We're all called out, okay? So we're all called to what? To the, the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Check faith versus action. It's a journey. It's a transformation. Abraham and Sarah went to Egypt. They gave away Sarah twice to different people. Had They had Ishmael by the handmaiden. But at the end of the day, Abraham became a giant of faith. And I pray that for me and for Beverly, for our children. I pray it for you and all who believe that we will undertake this great journey of faith and we will see all of these things come to bear. Ultimately, Abraham trusted. We know that God can bring the dead to life. We know El Shaddai. We've seen that. He brought Jesus back to life. He brought me back to life. We know that God will always provide Jehovah Jireh. We know that he's provided. I know that he's provided everything that I've ever needed. Well, I think that's a great story. Well, I don't know what you know God to be, but Abraham only knew him as El Shaddai and Jehovah Jireh. And then later on, he tells Moses, he says, you know, I am who I am, even though Abraham only knew me partially. And look at what Abraham did with a partial knowledge of God. Well, we too see through a glass dimly in our knowledge of God. But let's face it, we know a lot more about God than Abraham did. We have no excuses here. Let's let God build our faith through the transformation of our mind as we learn through his word about him. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for this wonderful lesson. I, I just It's hard for me to fathom the faith that was required of Abraham to raise that knife, knowing that he was going to take the life of his promised and precious son. But he believed. He believed that God had promised him Isaac. And he believed that God simply would just have to bring him back to life. Father, I pray that you would bring the dead people all around me back to life. Mm -hmm. Those who don't know Jesus as mm -hmm. their Savior. They're in the pit. And you need to wring them out. Mm -hmm. They need to come out of the Ur of Chaldees. They need to come out of bondage and slavery. They need to come out mm -hmm. of death because of their sin. Father, now that we are redeemed, I pray for us that we will be obedient because of our faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a great story. It's a great lesson. Next week we get to focus more on Isaac and then, of course, Jacob. Mm -hmm. So till then, we'll mm -hmm. see you. Stay safe. Know that we love you guys. Bye-bye.